Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, for our scripture reading. John chapter 14, please. John chapter 14. John 14. <clears throat> read a little bit lengthier passage here this morning. Uh, we're going to read the first 15 verses of John chapter 14. We'll read them responsibly, though. We'll begin together on verse 1, then I'll read 2, and we'll alternate reading like that until we end together on verse 15 of John chapter 14. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the Scripture. <clears throat> All of us standing to read God's Word, and let's begin together on verse 1, John 14. Ready? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. And Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? 
Let he that has seen me has seen the Father. And how speakest thou then? Show us the Father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. And let's pray. Father, thank you for the scripture this morning. Thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, that we have copies of it in our possession today. And Lord, I'm thankful for the good music today and the songs have spoke to our heart. And I pray, Lord, that it's been a blessing to you as we sung songs of praise to you. And now, Lord, we come to opening up your word together. And I pray that you'll speak to our hearts this morning. And give us the truth as only you can. And May your spirit speak to each and every heart. Bless the special now as it's sung, and may it minister to us, and may it prepare our hearts, that our hearts will be good soil that the word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in our lives. And I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. I dreamed of a city called glory, so bright and so fair. When I entered that gate, I cried, holy, the angels all met me there. They carried me from mansion to mansion and all oh, the sights I saw but I said I want to see Jesus the one who died for all then I bowed on my knees and cried holy My hands and sang glory, glory to the Son of God. As I entered the gates of that city, my loved ones all knew me so well. They showed me. The scenes were too numerous to tell. I saw Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Mark, Luke, and Timothy. But I said, I want to see Jesus, the one who died for me. Then I bowed on my knees and cried, Holy, 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 Holy. I clapped my hands and sang, Glory, Glory to the Son of God. <clears throat> Amen. That's good. Now, Father, we bow before you in prayer as we open up your word and 
desire to receive the truth you have for us today. And Lord, I pray thy Holy Spirit would minister to hearts this morning as only you can. And I pray your will will be done in these next few moments that we look into your word together. Please keep us from distractions, keep our minds from wondering to other things that would cause us to miss what you have for us today. And Lord, again, I pray if any in the room do not know you as their Savior, that they would trust you as their Savior today. And for those who do know you as Savior, that you would draw us closer to you because we were here this morning. And I'd like us to say when we leave here in a few minutes to be able to say it sure was good to be in the house of the Lord today. So Lord, do your work in these next few moments as only you can. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Jesus is going, is not, not long here before he's going to be arrested and beaten and eventually crucified. And so he's going to prepare his disciples for that. You would think that after spending most of them, after spending about 18 months with Christ, would have already understood this, but they really didn't. They, they really thought Jesus was here to set up a kingdom, to deliver them from the Roman oppression, <clears throat> and to establish a kingdom here right now. And so what he's about to tell them of his coming death and departure <clears throat> is quite a shock to them. And so they begin to ask questions. Actually, if your Bible's open to John 14, you're going to find out that Peter actually asked the first question. No surprise there. Uh, in, in verse, actually, verse, uh, chapter 13 and verse 36, do you notice? Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? And Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. And Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Again, we'll be saying more about that on Wednesday night as we study the Apostle Peter. But here they are. Peter asking questions about where he's going. The next person to ask a question is Thomas. And that comes in verse number 5. Thomas saith unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, <clears throat> and how can we know the way? And then the famous reply that Jesus gives, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And so the next person to ask is Philip. And Philip asked Jesus this, verse 8, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. It will satisfy us. And then Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you? And yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that has seen me, <coughs> excuse me, has seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest not that believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but of the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me or else believe me for the very work's sake. Philip has got a good request here. He really wants to see God. He wants to see the reality of God. And he said, if you'll just show Him to us, I think we'll understand things better, and we'll know Him better. Do you ever feel that way? Well, if I could just know God, if I could just see Him in this situation I'm in, it would make me feel a lot better. Oftentimes when we go through situations we don't understand, we go through trials or troubles or difficulties and we're not sure uh, what the purpose of it all is, we, you just, God at times feels very distant. And we feel like, I wonder if God knows what I'm going through. Does God know what's happening? Now in our head we know He does, but sometimes He still feels a distance away. Well, how can I know God's real? How can I know He's present? That's really what Philip is trying to to get at here. I don't think it's a bad question. I don't think it's something that we would chide him for. I think he's just saying, I'm going to understand better and I want to know him better. 
And that should be every one of our desires, not just to know God, or not just to know Christ, but to know Him better. That's what Paul meant when he said that I may know Him. He's not talking about that I can know who He is. He knew Christ as His Savior. He had trusted Him on the road to Damascus. But he said, I want to know Him. I want to, I want to know Him in an intimate way. I don't just want to know about Him. I want to know Him. And there's a great difference between knowing about someone and knowing someone. And here, he's desiring to move from a head knowledge to God, about God, I think, to a real heart knowledge. The word know is an important word in John's Gospel. You read that word know 141 times in John's Gospel. And it's a very important word. And, and if you study it, there's, there's, and this isn't the message, but there's four levels of knowing. Number one is knowing the facts. Knowing the facts. That's just, that's just gathering information and holding in your head. You know, you hold information up here. People think we think up here, but you don't. That just stores all the information. Where, where you think is in your heart. And not, not the thing beating in there, but the core of your being. The Bible says, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart. I'm thinking in my heart. Out of the abundance of the, of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay, So when it talks about our thinking, what happens is we, we pull that, that information out of our head into our heart and then it comes out of our mouth. Okay, So we have head knowledge. We, we get it and we store it in our heart. That's why sometimes uh, Brother Currington makes the mention of the fact to establish the RU program. He may mention the fact why is it that people can memorize large portions of the Bible and, and, and quote large portions of the Bible and yet still struggle with addictions. Uh, quote large portions of the Bible and then go out and, and do crack cocaine. You say, man, what's, what's wrong with that? Because they've stored it in their head. They haven't got it in their heart. And storing up Bible knowledge in your head means you'll know the facts. There are people in this room can give you facts about the Bible, but it hasn't changed their life at all. Because it's in their head, it's not in their heart. So the first step is just knowing the facts. And that puts the knowledge in your head. The second, the second part of knowledge, four levels of knowledge, the second level is knowing the truth behind the facts. That, that begins to give you a little bit of deeper head knowledge, but it still hasn't come to your heart because that's the third level. That's knowing the truth behind the facts personally. Where you personally begin to know and experience the truths of God's Word. I like what Jesus said to when, when um, I think it was Pilate who said something to him, and it might have been Herod. When he said something to him and Jesus said, knowest this thing of thyself or did others tell it of thee? In other words, do you know this for yourself to be true or are you just going off what other people have said? There's a time when you go off what other people have said, but there's got to come a time in your life when you've experienced yourself. You know that this is true. You know what God has done. That's personal. That's heart knowledge. And then the fourth level is when you not only uh, have the truth behind the facts personally, but you also have it intimately. That's where you have the deepest heart knowledge. It's the word, it's the word that's used in the Bible for a husband and a wife. When, it, when the angel came and to Mary and it said she had never known a man. It's a it's, a, it's, it's when Adam knew his wife Eve and they bear a son. Okay? That knowing is the intimacy. It's the most intimate thing between a husband and a wife. That's the knowing. That's the knowing that the Lord is talking about here. The highest level of knowing is intimacy. And it's not just physical. You know, there can be emotional intimacy and there can be, hopefully, most importantly, spiritual intimacy. And the desire of the believer should not just be to know about God or to have a head knowledge about God, but I'd want a personal knowledge of God. And yea, I'd say I'd want an intimate knowledge of God. That's what we should desire to have. To know Him intimately. You know, that's, that's the way it is in a, in a relationship. You know, when, when I first met my wife and we were just out of high school, just a couple years ago. 
you know, you, you just get to know one another and you start out with the very simple things and you just talk about, uh, you're just getting facts. You know, where you're going to go to college and, you know, what's your major and just introductory things that make sure you're an Ohio State fan. You know, all the fundamental things that have to be, <laughs> has to be there. It was, it was just at that, that superficial level. You know what I mean? And the more you talked and the more you spend time together, the more you want to go to the, another level, wanting to know more about them. I want to know some of the truth behind the facts. I'm trying to find out not just the surface stuff, but what's inside. What, 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 what makes you tick? What, 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 what do you, how do you think? What's your processes? And, and you learn more about the upper inner person. How were you brought up? What are some of the things you were taught and you learned? And as we begin to pursue a relationship, you know, I, I found out that I, I think I like her a lot. And so she liked me back, at least that little note I sent her that had a box there, you know, do you like me, do you not like me? You know, she checked the right one. And in time, we developed a relationship. We developed, we, we wanted to be together. You don't just want to say, yeah, you know, I, you, know you, 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 don't, you don't progress in your relationship until you say, you know what, I'm really happy just talking to you a few times a week on the phone. Doesn't work the way, does it, Rob? Huh? No. You know, as you progress in that relationship, you think, you know what? I, I don't I don't want I want more than just talking to you on the phone a few times a week. I want more than just seeing you a few times a week. I, I'm pursuing a, a different level. Something that goes beyond facts and statistics and I, I want I want the friendship and I want to have emotional and spiritual and eventually physical intimacy with this person. And I wanted that. And I desired that. And now for 39 years, come August, we've been getting to know one another better. Still trying to figure out how she thinks or what makes her tick. Still working on that, but it's coming. But, you know, when it comes to God, we begin with a set of facts about Him. That's what happened when someone explained to you or you maybe sat in church and you heard the preacher preach and you heard facts about God. You heard the facts that, that He created you and He loves you and that yet because of man's sin in the garden, all of us are born sinners and we're alienated from God. And yet God doesn't, He loves us and He doesn't desire we go to hell. And He loved us so much that He sent His only begotten Son into the world. And that Jesus lived a perfect sinless life and yet went to the cross and hung there and bled and died for us, for our sins, took our place. He was my substitute. He died for me. And yet He was buried and He rose again the third day. And, 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 and I learned that He rose and He ascended back to heaven and that He wants to save all those that come unto God by Him. And I found out that He's the only way as John 14, 6 says. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him. And he said, you know, I think I need to be saved. I think I want Jesus as my Savior. And that head knowledge became heart knowledge. That was a few years ago. I was six years old when I got saved. Can a, can a six-year-old get saved? Well, I know one of them that did. And, and received Christ my Savior, and now... For, for 55 years, 54 years, I've been trying to get to know Him better and know Him intimately. And, 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 and I hope, listen, and I hope tomorrow is better than today. I want to keep that going in that direction. That's what, I think that's what Philip was seeking when he said, show me the Father. Show us who God is. I want you to notice the, the meaningful request that Philip gave here and what his desire is. His desire 
is he's not expressing doubt. He simply wants to know God better. The longer you're saved, I think your desires begin to change. I think that you should become more interested in God Himself and not just what God can do for you. When we're born again, when we get saved, it's because of what God can do for us. You know what God can do? He can save me from burning in hell. I, I, I kind of like that idea. I think I, think I like that. I, I, I like forgiveness and I like mercy and I like grace. And so God, God gave me something that I needed. And then I find out after I'm saved, you know what else? He can give me joy. And He gives me peace. And He gives me guidance in my life. And He gives me satisfaction. And, and I like that. You find out that God can meet financial needs. God can supply our needs financially. God can supply our needs physically. God heals people. How many of you this past winter uh, were sick at one time or another with a flu or with cold or something like that? Sinus infection? Look at that. And guess what? You're not sick now. God healed you. See? God heals people. Thank, I'm thankful He does. That's why you're able to be in church today. And, and there's nothing wrong with going to God with our needs. He wants us to do that. He wants to be the source that we get our needs met. That's what God wants. He's our Father. But I think that as we grow in our relationship with God, we should at some point shift in our thinking to where I'm, 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 I'm more concerned with knowing the God of the gifts than just having the gifts of God. I want to know God. I want to, I want to be intimate with Him. I want to have a relationship with Him. I want a desire to know Him better. That's the problem I have with the, the name it and claim it religions of the world and the philosophy that gets taught in sometimes Christian circles. God, God isn't Santa Claus. God isn't the Aladdin where you rub the lamp and get whatever you want. That's not, that's not what He's there for. He's our Father and He's our Redeemer. He's my God. It's a, you know, most Christians never take their relationship with God to the next level. They're just satisfied that I know who He is. That's God. But that isn't what God desires, and that ought not to be what we desire. You know, it's not like the fellow, you know, his wife says, You never tell me you love me. He said, 28 years ago, we got married at that marriage altar. I told you I loved you, didn't I? She said, you did. He said, if I ever changed my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> well, that's not a very good marriage, is it? Huh? Not at all. You're not a very good Christian either. If you don't desire to know God. And grow in your relationship with Him. Go to the next level and know God more deeply and for God to be real in your life. Let me tell you how you can do this. You can, one of the things you could do is you could sometime get along with God and instead of, instead of asking for things, just spend time with Him. Everybody, how many of you have grown children in the room? I mean, they're up and out of the house, they're grown. Okay, good. How many of you have children that you rarely ever hear from them unless they want something? Huh? Anybody like that? Yeah. And when the phone rings, or you now we have cell phones, you can tell who's calling. It used to be you didn't know, you know, but now we know. And you, you say, oh, there's so-and-so. I wonder what they want. And they'll come up and they'll, they won't, they don't start right off saying what they want. They'll talk about other stuff and you, you know it's coming. I need to borrow this much or I need this much or I'm going to fix, I've got to have this. You know it's coming. But the, the, the point behind it is this. I wonder if the only time God hears from us is when we want something. And He sees our number pop up, which He doesn't. But you understand? Oh, I wonder what they want. Hmm? Or how about, I don't want anything. I just want to spend time with you. I just want to be in your presence. 
I just want to enjoy you for a little bit. I'm not here to get anything. I just want to be with you. In thy presence, the psalmist said, are pleasures evermore. Most Christians never arrive there. Sadly. Knowing God. I think his desire was good. I think Philip wanted to see the face of God. But his problem was, he wanted to see it with physical eyes. He physically wanted to see the Father. A literal manifestation of Him. Now, He had that in Jesus. Jesus' name was Emmanuel, which means God with us. <laughs> he didn't, didn't connect that. He didn't put that together. And a lot of people want to see God, and a lot of times what they want is they want a physical manifestation. That's why... That's why a guy can, you know, the, the rain can come down on an underpass and create some figure there and somebody sees the face of Jesus and thousands of people come to look at it. Somebody, you know, burns their, their grilled cheese a certain way and there's a picture of, you know, Mary. Everybody comes once to see the grilled cheese. What are they looking for? They're looking for some physical manifestation of God. I want to see Him. They're hungry to see through their physical eyes. And that's really the root of all idol worship. They just want a God they can see. They want to see the God they can touch. And immediately the Bible says in Romans 1 and verse 23, they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and the four-footed beasts and the creeping things. And so you, they turn to gods of their own making. When we turn to gods of our own making, we've turned to idols. We've broken the second commandment. Now I'm going to tell you something. An idol is not always something made out of wood or stone. We have we become more sophisticated with idols in America. And in an in, in idol is anything, listen. Anything we bow down to. Anything that we begin to revolve our life around. We even a, a popular show now, I don't know how many years it has been on television. It's even called American Idol. I wouldn't watch that show just because of the name. I won't talk about the music on there right now. Idol. Why would I watch something that says it's my idol? Yeah, you want me to move on, don't you? You see, but it's easy to tell what people's... It's easy for us to look and say, what are my idols? What's my passion? What do I pursue? What are my goals in life? You know, I... When I get ready on Sunday mornings, there's a financial show on the radio. And they're always talking about people and how much money they save up for retirement. To make sure that they can, you know, live the life that they want to live till they die. That their money doesn't run out before their life runs out. And talking about their people always talk about their their passion, their and, and they're just consumed with saving up enough money for retirement. The one couple that we talked about this morning had saved, saved up $1.7 million for retirement. And we're afraid they don't have enough to make it. Well, that's going to last them long enough. It's, it's, it's whatever you become consumed with becomes your God. One of the things, and, and you have to understand, I, I grew up in a, in a home where we, we played sports. And whatever the season was, we played it. Now, we're talking about major sports. Basketball, football, baseball. Okay? And, and we played it whatever season it was. And we followed it. And we were fans. And we watched it. And we, we, did, we did all that. I love sports. But listen to me. Sports has become a god in our country. It's 
way out of whack. And, and, and it's, it's destroying our young families. It's become an idol. So many, you, you understand, you have to understand something. When I was growing up, and, and, and it wasn't, we had electricity and everything. It wasn't that long ago, right? <laughs> and wasn't, don't think, oh yeah, back then. No, 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 no. It, it was, you understand, we didn't, you didn't play Sundays. Didn't, didn't happen. And, and you just, you didn't have that. Now, they, they, they take you all the time. Tournaments and travel teams and, and money goes out to that that, that, that that puts families in financial binds and debts because they want their children to be involved with this stuff. And yet, what, all of a sudden, Saturdays and Sundays become ball games instead of church. I'll guarantee you right now, you could go across our community and there'll be, there'll be families and young couples with young children and they're at the ball game on Sunday morning instead of being in church on Sunday morning. Right. Happens all the time. And, and, and Satan has taken something that is good. There's some great lessons to learn in sports and being on a team and working with a teammate and, and character and discipline and all those things. There's some great lessons to be learned. Take something that can be good and he's made it an idol. You can achieve what you seek. And your idol may not be that, but it could be, it could be making money so you're consumed with work and, and money and, and your passion is to get more things. And can I tell you something? God may allow you to achieve what you want. You know what you'll find out? But you're not satisfied. It doesn't, it doesn't fill the hole that's in your heart. So man, I got all this. It was what Tom Tom Brady said. I think when he won his first Super Bowl, and he, he looked and you know what he said? He said, "Is this all there is?" I mean, I thought this would be the euphoria, and man, I just feel fulfilled and satisfied. I've reached the pinnacle of my profession. And he said, "This is it." He found out it didn't fill the hole that's in his heart, and no idol will. No idol will. So I think he had a meaningful request. I think Philip's on the right track here, but he had his deficiency of wanting to see it physically, not spiritually. But here's what Jesus told him. Verse number 9. Jesus said, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? Boy, that would be a piercing question from Jesus, wouldn't it? Would Jesus say that to you this morning? Have you known me this long, and yet you don't know me? He that has seen me has seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? In other words, they, and I don't think it was just to Philip, I think the other disciples were listening in too, and I think he kind of talking to all of them. Can you really spend this much time with me day and night and not know this? Not understand this? It's possible to be in the presence of the obvious and never see it. And they certainly were. It's through Jesus you know the Father. Uh, verse, number, verse number one, Let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? What's the rest of the verse say? Believe also in Me. Without Me, you're not going to get to God. Without Me, you're not going to know God. You have to know God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Now I know we mentioned this in Sunday school. There are some things in creation and nature that can help us tell us about God. And you can't look at how the world was created without knowing that somebody designed this. This couldn't have just happened. In fact, even evolutionists are now making the point, and they don't even realize it, that they'll say this, because all of creation screams out that there's a design to it, they say this, evolution has designed the river the river otter to be an excellent swimmer. Did you ever that quote? They, they said, evolution has designed the river otter to be an excellent swimmer. Can I got tell you something? Evolution, and evolution can't design anything. The very word evolution uh, means by chance, random chance, things adapting themselves to make themselves better. It has nothing to do with design. If they say it's designed to swim, somebody had to design it. 
And they admit there must be a designer. We know that designer to be God. He's the creator of all things. Now how do we see, if we see God in Jesus Christ, how do we see God in Christ? Two ways. Number one, we see God in Christ by the words that Christ spoke. The words that He spoke. When you hear the voice of Jesus, you hear the voice of God. I had older sisters growing up. You know, how many had older sisters growing up? How many have older sisters that like to boss you around when they were growing up? Yeah, that's just what older sisters do. Older sister would say, you better clean your room up. And being the good boy I was, I'd say, you're not my mom and dad. Hmm? Real original line, I know, but that's the way it was. You're not my boss. <laughs> but if they ever said, dad said, you better do that. Well, that changes things a little bit. Because dad said so. When Jesus spoke, you have to realize that's God speaking. That's how, that's how at the age of 12, he could be at the temple going back and forth with the scholars and the scribes at the temple as a 12-year-old boy. He was dealing with them and they were amazed at his wisdom and his knowledge. When, they, when the Pharisees and scribes sent some men to arrest him one time, they stood and listened to him first. Well, that was a mistake. Because you know why? They went back. They never arrested him. They went back to their leaders. You know what they said? Never a man spake like this man. <laughs> we never anybody talk like he talks. He's amazing. And those were the words of God. They were astonished at what he was saying. Jesus said, I'm meek and lowly of heart. The things that Jesus said. He spoke of believing in things that you can never see with your eyes. You have to believe and you have to have faith. The words that He spoke are powerful words. The words that we still read today in the Scripture of His are powerful words because they're God's words. So I can see God in Jesus by what He said, but I also see Him through the works that He did. The works that Jesus did. Now I know the primary work Jesus came to do with salvation. He came to die on the cross for our sins. He came to save us from our sins. His primary work was not to feed the multitudes or to walk on water, to heal the, the, the blind, or to raise the dead like He did Lazarus. His primary work, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to save folks. But every good work that He did while He was here was done that we might see God. Think about this. When he, when he healed the sick, you see the mercy of God. When He calmed the storm, you see the power of God. He just would say, peace be still, and man, it stopped. That's God's power. When He lived sinlessly, you see the holiness of God. When He, when he ate in fellowship with sinners, you see the grace of God. And when He died on the cross for our sins, you see the love of God. Everything He did was to show us God, who He is, and His power and His love and His forgiveness and His mercy. Jesus was God, and He is God. Through His words and through His works. Now there's, a, there's something He tells them here in verse 12 that's amazing. Notice what he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. Well, here's, we, we, we had seen the meaningful request from Philip. We saw the Master's reply from Jesus. But now here's huh, a magnificent revelation to them. They're thinking, Jesus is leaving, it's all over. And Jesus says, no, I'm leaving, it's just beginning. You're going to do greater works than what you've seen because I'm not going to be here. Now can you really can we really do greater works than Jesus? He said so. 
Now, not, not in quality, but certainty in quantity. You go to Acts chapter 1 and you see Pentecost and in Acts chapter 2 and you find out that 3,000 people receive Christ as their Savior and are baptized in one day. That's a pretty good Sunday. That's pretty amazing. That's a greater work. That's a greater work than they saw in the whole time they were with Jesus. They're seeing that come to pass. Millions of Christians can day. This morning, and, and really, you know, in, in many places, it's already Sunday night. India, Philippines, Japan, on that side of the world, Sunday's already over. But just in the time zones that we have right now, you understand there's millions of places where the gospel's being preached this morning where folks will receive Christ as their Savior. Millions of people can be saved today. In one day. Greater works than these shall you do. Because I go to my Father. Jesus was one person. He, he operated everything He did, I think, in about a 30 mile, 30 mile radius of where He was born. Limited in that way that, that we are not. And when you do greater works, listen to me, when we get involved with the greater works, that's when we can that's when we can get to know God in a way we never knew Him before. Notice how he follows that up. Verse 12 talks about the greater works. Verse 13, he says, What you shall ask in My name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you will ask anything in My name, I will do it. And he goes right to prayer. Do you think one of the greater works we can do is prayer? He says, y'all to, got to pray. And, and if there's anything we need reminded of, it's prayer. One of the things I'm, I guarantee you're going to hear tonight from the testimonies of those who went to Mexico on the mission trip is the importance of prayer. And how God, God answers prayer. And in miraculous ways. And, and He does it every day. He could do it every day in our lives and He would do it, we're aware of it every day, if we'd be aware of it. And if we would pray about everything. You say, wait a minute, that verse said I can ask anything I want and God will give it to me. Whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do. That's what it says, but the verse doesn't end there, does it? What's the rest of the verse say? Oh, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So guys, I can ask anything I want and God will grant it as long as what I'm asking will glorify God in the Son. I doubt giving you a million dollars would accomplish that. So it's not just a blank check. It's something that would be according to His will and that would be honoring to Him. The second way we get involved with doing more works is not just prayer, but number 15, verse number 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience. Obedience. God expects us, if we love Him, we keep His commandments. So we love Him, we obey Him. It doesn't go very far if your child at home, you tell them what to do and, and clean their room like we used before. Clean your room up. And they come to you and they say, I sure love you, Dad. You're the best dad in all the world. You're wonderful. You're so strong. You're so handsome. I sure love you. You can say, well, thank you very much, and you're right on all counts. But you're going to ask him this. Did you clean your room? All their accolades and all their talk doesn't mean much if they do not obey you. And God says, I, I want you to, to praise me, and I want you to love me. And, I, I, and, and that doesn't mean God doesn't enjoy our words but when it comes to loving God, His love language is obedience. Acts of service. If you love me, keep my commandments. Obedience. And by the way, no amount of prayer will ever make up for disobedience. You know, we quote promises sometimes in the Bible that maybe aren't ours to claim. 
but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Isn't that a great promise? But did you know that promise isn't for everybody? That promise was given to the church at Philippi because they had given time and time again to the Apostle Paul in his need. And because they were faithful in giving and supplying his need, in response to that, the promise is, my God shall supply all your need. If you're robbing God and you're not giving and you're not uh, giving to help meet needs, God says that promise, does, you don't qualify. It's not yours to claim. If you, you know, it's like something I read the other day, Pastor, a guy got a text message, says we need to really talk to you about getting our finances in order. As soon as we get back from Disney, we want to talk to you about getting our finances in order. But, of course, we're, we're going over to the ocean the week after that. But when we get back from there, we want to talk to you about getting our finances in order and not spending too much. You see, no amount of, no amount of counsel, no amount of prayer makes up for disobedience. And that, if that's the way you live, you cannot say, my God will supply all my need. Not if you're robbing Him. Not if you're not giving what you should. Boy, that's quiet. Then he, verse 15, don't miss the first part. If ye love me. If you love me, you keep my commandments. The love motive is always the right motive. I think Jesus is saying basically, if you love me, you'll pray. If you love me, you'll give. If you love me, you'll serve. If you love me, you'll obey. If you love me, you'll witness. Hudson Taylor, who was a great missionary to the Chinese and was looking for more people to go to China as missionaries, he, he said, oh, you're looking for people who have a burden for the Chinese people. He said, no, I'm not. I'm looking for people who love Jesus Christ. Because if they love Jesus Christ they'll have a burden for the Chinese people. But they have to love Jesus. When we love Him and we want to do what we do because we love Him, then we'll want to know Him and He will make Himself known to us. The reason that God becomes real on a missions trip and when we're away in another country is we're there to do something for Him. Who wants those people to get the Gospel? God does. Who wants them to hear about Jesus Christ? God does. Who wants to see them saved more than we want to see them saved? God does. And so God shows up. And we get to see Him show up. <coughs> works that I do shall you do greater. And greater works than these shall you do. The, uh, if you look down, he tells them in verse 16, and we're going to end, that he'll send them the Comforter, which is the Holy Spirit. I will pray the Father, he will give you another Comforter that ye may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. And that's how you do the work. When you work for God out of love for God, God gives us the Holy Spirit of God. You know what He does? He empowers us to do what we ought to do. You don't, you don't, do well as a Christian by trying harder. You do it by trusting more. By yielding to the Holy Spirit that's in you. I don't want to see what I can do. I want to see what God can do through me. I want to see what God can do through you in your life. Love. That's why when Peter denied Him, when Jesus met him on the shore that morning. What did Jesus ask Peter? Lovest thou me more than these? 
What was the issue? Oh, I know he shouldn't have been following afar off. He shouldn't have been out in that crowd. He was hanging around the wrong people. But Jesus didn't deal with any of that. He just dealt with the root issue. Do you love me? More than these? You need to love him more deeply than what he did. The purpose of the works, of course, are to glorify God. By the way, that's what we're here for. We talked about going in the next level. You know, obviously, as a six-year-old boy, I didn't get saved because my life wasn't glorifying to God. You know why a six-year-old boy got saved? I didn't want to go to hell. I didn't want to burn in hell. And that's, that's not bad. That's true. And that's why probably many people get saved is we don't want to die and go to hell. But, you know, once, once I'm saved and I grow and I begin to learn, you know, I've transitioned from that. I've told you before, I, as a young boy, I obeyed my dad because I didn't want to get a whipping. Yeah, my dad spanked me. That's why I am the way I am today. Okay? But you understand, that was fear punishment. That's why I listened. But as I got older and I got bigger and I got stronger, I did not obey my dad for fear of punishment. Could take a, uh, take a belt, give me a five minute licking, that's fine. Now I can go out and do what I want to do anyway. Get a point where that's not the issue. I came to a point in my life where where. When I did something wrong one time, my dad looked at me. He didn't punish me. He didn't spank me. He didn't ground me. He looked me in the eye. And he said, Stan, I'm disappointed in you. Wow. You know, that hurt worse than any spanking ever got in my life. And I knew then, I, I don't ever want to see him do that again. I don't ever want to see that look again. There comes a time in your Christian life when you obey God and you love God and you serve God, not because, well, I better go. He's going to do something to me. Oh, there's so much more than that. I don't want Him to be disappointed in me. I want to be aware of His presence. Whether I eat or drink or whatsoever we do, do all to the glory of God. The glory means to, to put in a good light. To, to make somebody look good. Everything we do, we're to make God look good. One of the ways you do that is you be aware that He's there at all times. He is. Why do, we, why do we say things we shouldn't say? Why do we do things we shouldn't do? Why do we, you know, we get into situations and, you know why? Because we lose the awareness that God is right with us. Where was God when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden? He's there. Isn't God omnipresent? Sure. They lost the awareness that He was there. And that's what we do when we sin. We lose the awareness that He's there. That's what we do when we snap at somebody. We say something unkind to someone. Or we gossip. We say something we shouldn't say. We've lost the awareness that God's there. I always want to be aware that He's there. Because I want to please Him. I want to make Him look good. I'll close with this. There was a house fire, and a young boy was forced to the roof. His father stood on the ground below with outstretched arms, calling to his son, Jump! I'll catch you! Jump! I'll catch you! He knew the boy had to jump in order to save his life. But all the boy could see was the flame and the smoke, the blackness. He was afraid to leave the roof. But the father kept yelling to him, jump, jump, I'll catch you. The boy kept protesting. And he said, finally, Daddy, I can't see you. Daddy, I can't see you. But the daddy yelled up to him, son, I can see you. And that's all that matters. And there's times that we get into situations and we say, God, I can't see you. 
But would you listen to God telling you, I can see you, and that's all that matters. He's there. Let's glorify Him. Let's realize He's there. Let's be aware that He's there. And you do that, by the way, by prayer, by obedience, by love. And you'll see that He's real. He's with us. He's always there. Let's glorify Him as our God. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord, for these apostles and the questions they asked Jesus that day. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus giving us instruction about knowing the Father. And Lord, I know that I, I, most of the people in this room would say they have Christ as their Savior. That they know Jesus Christ. They know they have eternal life. Yet, Lord, the challenge today is that we would move on to another level in our Christian walk. That we would desire to know You personally and intimately. That we would constantly be aware of Your presence with us. And that we would desire to know You intimately. And to be aware that You're here and that we would bring glory to You at all times. Thank You. That You will allow us to do greater works. And through prayer and through obedience and through love, we can see you show up in a real way. Seems simple. Yet, Lord, it's steps we need to take. And I pray you'd help us to do so this morning.